today we're going to think a little bit about uh, the second half of the story about uh, analyzing big data, which has got to do with data analytics and particularly prescriptive analytics and predictive analytics. We'll remind you what those terms mean shortly. But the building block of all of that kind of analytical work is something called models. And so we're going to think a bit about what a model is and how a model works and then spend most of our time looking at the most obvious, most well used type of model, which is the, the linear model. So let me take you to our PowerPoint slides. So the topic of predictive and prescriptive analytics and the role of models in that. So if you recall, for those of you who've been watching earlier videos, we've got a, uh, a framework for thinking about what business intelligence is all about using data. And we've got uh, kind of a, a first half of the analysis, which involves looking back and understanding what's been going on through describing data, some form or other, through some kind of diagnostic tools where we try and pick up patterns in data and uh, various things that you might have seen on earlier videos cover those areas. But the data analyt analytics side of work involves a lot more than that. It involves actually looking forward into the future and saying what's going to happen in the future. So can we predict what's going to happen? Can we control what's going to happen, which is the prescriptive element of it? In both of those cases, what we need to do is build models. So predictive analytics is about building models that allow us to predict outcomes. So it's what can, what can we learn from the past, what patterns can we capture in some kind of model which allows us to predict the future. With prescriptive analytics, we're doing a very similar thing. We're building models which will actually help us understand the mechanisms by which human behavior or uh, other forms of interventions actually influence outcomes. So we understand what's going on in the, in the prescriptive. That's its main purpose. Having understood the mechanisms, we can then intervene in processes. We can uh, work out, for example, that uh, the reason that some companies do better than others is because they have better branding so uh, of their products or better market recognition because of the advertising campaigns that they go on. So having learnt that, we can then design actions that will influence outcomes. We can we can spend some money improving our branding and consequently improve our impact in the market and so on. So prescriptive analytics is primarily about understanding with a view to change. Predictive analytics obviously has an element of that because you're building models in both cases, but it's more about trying to predict the future, which is obviously very important to any business planning. You, you need to be able to know what's going to happen, at least have some idea about what's going to happen so that you can plan for the future. So what is a model all about? Well, just stepping back a little bit, a model is a, is a word that's used quite frequently. And what I guess the way to think about a model is that whatever it is that we're interested in is always very complicated. There's many, many factors that, that uh, influence the way various factors influence uh, interact with each other. So a model is a um, usually mathematical representation of the interactions of various factors. And it's by definition a simplified model. It's a, it's a simplified way of representing what's going on. Everything in the, that's going on in the world is way too complex. There are too many unknown factors. So what we try and do is simplify it down into something that divine, design, describes a bit of a process and the key variables in that process. So the standard sort of model that is very typically used sort of thinks about things as uh, starting with some inputs. So we have a bunch of inputs into the process that we're looking at and those inputs uh, go into some sort of process which transforms the inputs into an output. So if you're thinking about making stuff, this is pretty easy. So the inputs could be the raw materials that you actually use, the, um, the, uh, the uh, coal that you mine out of the ground, for example, might be one of your inputs. Then you take that coal into a big uh, power plant and use it to generate electricity. So the electricity is the is the output. The processor is the big plant that burns the coal and turns it into electricity. The raw material is the coal itself. So we think about that fairly easily in terms of stuff, but it's actually also just as sensible to think about it in terms of uh, uh, human behavior or services that we provide and so on. So that if there's certain factors that we can identify that drive a process transformation and we can see outputs. That's the theory of it. So each of those steps there involves, uh, well, first one here, we've got a bunch of variables, which we think about as our inputs. We've got a variable, which we think is our outputs. And then we've got some kind, of, some kind of model, which is the processor that relates together the inputs to the outputs. 
that's the idea. So the model that we're going to look at is, is the simplest of all models, which is the linear model, which essentially takes a bunch of inputs and relates them. I can see this equation down the bottom here. A bunch of inputs x and relates them to some output y, y via a linear equation. So those of you who've uh, studied your high school mathematics some time in the recent past would be used to equations for a straight line which might look something like this. y equals mx plus c. m is some kind of gradient and c is some kind of intercept. Well, essentially that's the equation for a line relating y and x together. So if I was to draw a line with x and y there, that line there would be captured by an intercept of c and a slope of m. If I increase x by one unit, that's how much y goes up by. So that equation captures a linear relationship between x and y. Well, essentially what we're doing here is the same thing. Uh, it's a linear equation. You see down the bottom of the screen here, but the equation is a bit more complicated because we've got more than one x. So if we were going to try and draw a graph of this model here, it would actually become quite difficult. It's fine if you've only got one x. You could almost imagine doing it with two x's because you've got a third dimension of your graph coming out here somewhere and so you've got this three-dimensional line but once you get beyond three dimensions you can't even draw it. But, so that's conceptually though no different to just drawing a straight line but relating y and x together. But the trick now is that we have a number of x's and that's not surprising because nobody would ever believe that the output that goes through this linear process is driven by just one input. There are always many factors that produce the output. So it's going to be pretty necessary for us very quickly to get into multiple factor models and to look at the potential sort of interaction between those. So why is an outcome of interest? Could be how many, how much electricity do you generate from your coal plant? Uh, or it could be uh, how many customers do you have who are unhappy with your service? Or how many times does this person go to the doctor? Any possible outcome that's of interest. The X's are what we describe as causal variables. So those are the factors that we think cause Y. They're the inputs that, having gone through the process, would produce the output. So in this case, we're going to say that there are 1, 2, 3, 4, up to K of these X's. So the K could be 1, could be only one causal factor. But, you know, that's very unlikely. More than likely, we've got two, three, four, however many X's factors that we uh, think drive Y. We then have some parameters, beta, which we'll come back to in a moment. Those beta parameters are basically the same as the slope. You'll see that each beta 1 is multiplied by beta 2, beta X1, beta 2 is multiplied by X2 and so on. So those are basically like the slope that you have in this Y equals MX plus C equation here, but there's many slopes. There's a slope for each of the X's. And then you've got this thing up here, at the start, which doesn't have an x after it, which corresponds to like the intercept c in your equation for a straight line. So that's your model. In a sense, that part there is the model relating y and x together. But then we've got this bit at the end here, which we call the error. And the error is there because no model will be perfect. If you tell me the values of the x's in a particular case, uh, they, the inputs, in other words, you, you can't guarantee that with a given set of inputs you'll produce exactly this output y. There's always some unknown random factors or many other factors that influence the outcome y that you're not including in your model and those are all captured by the error e. So they represent all other things that are not included in the model. Just thrown into the what we call the error term. Okay, so the model is given by the x's in their formula, formulaic relationship with y without the error e. So it's the difference between what the, the error therefore becomes the difference between the actual data and what the model predicts y would be. So the model, when we talk about a prediction, we use y hat, not y. So the actual data is y, and the predicted value of y using our model is y hat. And the difference between those two is your error. Okay. So when someone says to you, what is the linear regression model? That's it there, the formula for it. And you can see why we start here, because obviously in the real world, models that relate inputs X to output Y uh, could become quite complicated. You could have uh, sort of non-linear relationships. You could have sort of trigger relationships where Y doesn't change at all until X reaches some particular point. There's all sorts of messy, complicated ways that 
a change in X can have influence Y. We're starting with the most basic, which is the sort of straight line relationship. That's enough for us to, to chew over because it's already, as you'll see over the, uh, this video and, and over subsequent videos, there's enough complexity just in this simple model. But obviously, eventually, we want to get to more complicated models. But let's stick with what we've got first. Now, how do we interpret these parameters, the betas? What do they mean? Well, remember briefly I said here that these represent the first beta represents some kind of intercept like C in your equation for the line. And these ones here are a bit like the M in the equation for a line as well. They're the slopes. A little bit harder to get your head around because there are more than one slope. So here's how to think about it. Suppose all of the X's were zero. X1, X2 were all zero. So you'd had no uh, inputs in this case. All the, well, you had the inputs, but all the inputs took the value zero. So no money spent on advertising, no, in, no sales staff, etc. What would the model predict? Well, just look at the equation up here and put in x1 equals zero, x2 equals zero, etc. What you would get is y hat equaling beta naught plus x1 is zero, so zero plus zero plus zero, all zeros. So I just get y hat equals beta naught. So beta naught is the predicted value of y, what the model predicts y would be when all your values of x were zero. Okay, that's pretty straightforward. So if that tells you, if you did nothing about advertising, employed no sales staff, and uh, had no promotional campaigns, or whatever the other x's might be, this tells you, this number here tells you how much you can expect to sell, if y happens to be your sales. Okay, so that's the intercept interpretation. What about the other variables, the other parameters rather? Let's take beta one. Suppose we've now got all the x's taking some value, x1, x2, x3, but then let's increase x1 by just one unit and leave all the other x's the same. Then the original model was y hat equals beta naught plus beta 1 x, x1 plus beta 2 x2. And now we're going to increase x1 by one unit. So we now get this equation here. Same everywhere, except that instead of beta 1 times x1, I now have beta 1 times x1 plus 1 for that component. So then subtract this y hat, new, minus this y hat up here, and you'll see the beta naught minus beta naught is 0. Beta 2x2 minus beta 2x2, 0. Beta kxk minus beta kxk, 0. So everything here is 0. Beta 1x1 minus beta 1 x1 is 0, so the only thing left is the beta 1 times 1. In other words, the difference between the predicted value of y in the new, when, when you increase x by 1 versus what you'd leave when you have x1 equal to its original value is just equal to beta 1. So that tells you the interpretation of beta 1. Beta 1 is the change in how, the model's prediction of y for a one unit change in x, holding all the other x's unchanged. So that first half of that sentence is exactly what we mean when we talk about the slope of a line like you do in your high school mathematics. Increase x by 1, how much does y go up by? m. That's the slope. So that's what we're saying here. Increase x by 1, x1 by 1, this is the change in the value of y in the model. In other words, it's the slope. So that's that part there really is exactly the same as what you've thought about when you think about a line, what a slope is. The second part is is the extra bit that perhaps we're not familiar with those of you, thus relating this back to sort of learning about lines. Namely, it's not quite the slope in the normal sense of the word because you've got other x's in the model. So it's a variation on the slope where if you said, suppose all the other x's don't change at all, and just this one changes by one unit, how much would y change by? Okay, so that's a very important qualification and it's something that we will come back to in uh, other examples if you watch subsequent videos because it makes a big difference to how you understand the model. It's a critical thing and it's, it's um, just worth stepping back and reflecting on it for just a moment that when you build a model here, you want to know about 
the purpose of building the model, say, for example, in this case, might be simply to understand the processes that are happening in our organisation so that we can improve things. Perhaps we're not happy with our output. We're not happy with how much we're producing or how much we're selling or what have you, given how much it's costing us. So we want to understand how changing various inputs might affect things. You know, if I spend more money on advertising, if we buy new machinery for our coal processing, will it uh, give us better uh, electricity production for the same amount of coal, etc. So you're thinking about improving your processes and changing your inputs, etc., to achieve that. So, but the problem is you've got multiple inputs interacting with each other in this complicated process. So how do you think about changing some inputs and seeing what effect they have? Well, the linear model and the way we think about it says, think about it by isolating out each in particular input and seeing what its effect is. Isolate it out by holding the other inputs unchanged and just changing this one input. And that's essentially what those parameters, beta one, and for that matter, beta 2, beta 3, and so on, up to beta k, represent. You just want to isolate out the effect of x1 on y, holding the other x's unchanged. And so you do that using exactly this, this uh, parameter, beta 1, and so on. Now, of course, there's one further thing to say about the model, and that is that we've written down a model as if we know these parameters. But in fact, in practice, we don't. These are population parameters, and what we've been thinking about in previous videos where we've thought about uh, sort of inference and estimation is very quickly acknowledging that we never know the truth. We never know the true model. We never have all the data in the world, so we don't know the parameters that drive a particular model. We know that they exist, but we just don't know what they are. So what we do is we take a sample and we use that sample to estimate them. The most common example that people think about is using a sample to calculate the sample mean and using the sample mean to estimate the population mean, which is the thing you're really interested in. In this case, we're doing exactly the same thing intuitively, but instead of estimating a mean, we're now estimating a whole bunch of parameters of our model. Beta naught, the intercept, beta one up to beta k, the slopes. So we do that using the same intuitive approach. We get a sample of data for y and the x's, and we use some complicated bits of mathematics to calculate the intercept and the slopes for the sample. And we use those intercepts and slopes to estimate the population values. So in fact, the estimated model will have hats on the, on the betas to represent the fact that they are estimates based on a sample. And that, so that becomes what we call our estimated model. The true model is this thing here, where you've got the true betas, but you never know the true model. The estimated model, get used to that jargon, is this one here where you replace the beta values with their estimates beta hats. Okay, that's enough on this particular topic. I hope you found that introduction to the linear regression model helpful. If you'd like to know more about it, then I recommend uh, tracking your way through some of the subsequent uh, uh, recordings. Thanks.